the recording has started. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Mark Horshevsky. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Moving Worlds. Uh, we're a Seattle-based social enterprise uh, with teammates across uh, actually five, five continents right now. Um, although we're, we're, still, uh, we're still a small team, we're about 10 people, uh, but we support uh, a variety of projects very focused on helping social enterprises build capacity, which is why I'm really excited about today's conversation, uh, which is how social enterprises can scale through revenues and partnerships with the corporate sector. Uh, there is a massive amount of investment flowing from corporations into the social enterprise sector right now. Uh, just a few couple highlights from this past year, SAP committed 5% uh, of its procurement spending. So all the spending they do in hiring agencies, marketing, travel, meals, office management, et cetera, going to be spent with social enterprises, another 5% with diverse businesses. Um, for those of you interested in, and maybe following the social enterprise world forum movement, there's a whole work group just on social procurement. We're seeing uh, the results of this being um, you know, millions from individual companies being spent on social enterprises. Uh, so we're gonna, we're gonna kind of get into that, but uh, it's why we have this session. I do wanna give a shout out to Sarah and conveners. Um, we've been uh, huge beneficiaries of the uh, uh, Accelerating the Accelerators kind of movement and network. Uh, so just really wanna say thanks for, um, for having us here. Uh, and to all of you that are taking the time to join, uh, um, I wanna say thank you. We will have some time for some kind of ideas and, and inputs here. Um, and, uh, but let's see kind of how, how this goes. Um, because of our size, this is ripe for conversation and interruption. So I will keep my chat box open. Uh, I will also um, uh, just stop talking if you decide to unmute yourself and, and start talking. So by all means, feel free to, to jump in uh, and hopefully that'll be interesting. Otherwise, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna get started with kind of an introduction um, on some research that we did this past year, which is why I feel so confident saying, if you're trying to scale as a social enterprise, I actually wouldn't go raise money. I'd instead try and go find revenue-based partnerships with the corporate sector. Um, I know it's a big statement that's counter to a lot of what we're seeing um, in, if you ask social enterprises what they want to do, they just say, <laughs> give me money, raise capital. Uh, and we're trying to show that um, most capital isn't flowing to social enterprises in that way. Here's another way that, that you can scale up. So um, uh, that is based on research. So I wanna share the findings of that research. And then from there, actually get into, into some discussion and, and collaboration. So uh, with all that said, I'm gonna jump in, just quick skim on chat. I don't see anybody, uh, uh, any questions yet. So, so we're gonna go. Um, so as said, uh, my name is Mark Roshevsky. Originally, uh, Anna Palachek was going to join. Um, uh, she leads our programs uh, and is based in Brazil. A little later, timestamp, um, and uh, and so you're you're just you're just stuck with uh, with me today. Um, as mentioned, Moving Worlds does focus on building um, capacity and helping social enterprises scale by connecting them with professionals, corporations, impact investors, and more for the sake of creating a more sustainable and equitable planet. And uh, as we'll see later in the presentation today, this idea of helping companies really green and create regenerative uh, supply chains uh, and distribution chains is where we see uh, the motivation for such uh, big spending with social enterprises. Um, now, uh, part of the uh, programs that we do in order to do that include, include programs specifically to professionals. We operate an institute, which is a global community learning management platform and skills-based management network uh, to get professionals directly connected to social enterprises, um, as well as learning in community with each other. Uh, we support social enterprises directly with our S-Grid Accelerator program, um, very targeted capacity building to help social enterprises build connections with the corporate sector. We also partner with companies, Microsoft, SAP, PayPal, and more uh, to help them think about how they can educate and engage their employees to be better partners to the social enterprise movement. Um, to make this just a little bit more real, social enterprises on our platform, uh, when they create an account and when they're accepted into the program, uh, they can request training. We help them find trainers through our global professional network, as well as through our corporate partners. They can ask for an advice call. They can help create connections. They can find coaching or mentoring support. They can submit projects. They can browse our expert pool around the world, or they can also request a design challenge where they can get input from other peers in their network for support. Uh, so 
Uh, but we came to talk about our research. So every year, uh, business to business um, spending. So this is only business to business spending that is spent with small and medium enterprises. This is from a World Bank um, report that says $12 trillion is spent every year in business to business transactions for uh, uh, social enterprises, or we could argue the category where social enterprises tend to play, at least the vast majority of them. Now, that 12 trillion uh, number, um, when compared to the $150 billion, which is what all governments combined spent on global development aid, or the $790 billion impact investing, all assets under management, is really a massive number. It's something worth looking at if we really want to think about creating an impact. Now, what we're also seeing is that there's a rapid increase in the way that companies are thinking about engaging with the social enterprise sector, right? So they're thinking about that $12 trillion that they're spending and saying, how can we spend that more effectively to also achieve our own equity and sustainability targets? As of 2019, 72% of companies mentioned the sustainable development goals in their reporting. One quick caveat here, especially for those that you are a little bit more read on this topic, mention doesn't mean target. It just means something like, hey, we have carbon emissions, right? And maybe this relates to, uh, uh, to the, I don't know, uh, I'm trying to now remember the, both the number of the goal and the exact statement. And of course, I'm blanking on it. Um, but let's say life, life on land. Uh, now, 14% of companies do actually have targets. So that's a move in the right direction, but we've got a long way to go. One thing that the report highlighted is that we really need a step change in the scale and depth of business engagement, right? And what I argue and what our research um, showed is that we are seeing some step changes, not everywhere and not from every company, but we are starting to see some notable changes. Um, few quick examples. Uh, earlier in the introduction, I did mention how SAP is committing uh, a 5% of its global procurement spend to social enterprises, another 5% to diverse owned businesses. Uh, Unilever recently made um, uh, um, some other similar initiatives, eBay. Um, and so we're seeing this rapid increase. We're also seeing some great pilots from companies like Johnson & Johnson, Ikea and Bork. Um, we're also seeing a big move that uh, companies uh, Microsoft, Starbucks, uh, Apple, others are actually tying comp uh, executive compensation. Um, in my in my book, if if I can go there, I still don't think it's enough, and it's not soon enough. Um, but at least it is a step for now. And what we're seeing is there's more innovation and more power going to corporate social responsibility leaders uh, and ESG leaders and uh, product and supply chain leaders to say, we have to figure out how to partner, not just with businesses that uh, aren't enslaving children, but rather companies that are paying fair wages, uh, offer safe and equitable and just work environments and are environmentally uh, uh, responsible. So some big moves across every sector. Um, and what we set out to answer is to say, is this just like a couple? Like, is this just some, 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 another year of Larry Fink, you know, greenwashing? Uh, or is this, is this really a movement? And is there an incentive beyond just some publicity and, and press? And there's a good report from Deloitte called Driving Corporate Growth Through Social Impact, which says that there are five reasons why companies are actually interested in investing in social impact partnerships. The first one is it creates new market opportunities, right? Um, uh, so this is being able to tap into new customer bases or, or developing new products. The next one is taking regulatory relationships from reactive to proactive. So this is more governmental, right? One of the reasons that we're seeing companies like Microsoft be very proactive in, um, in their own kind of data privacy and data ethics issues is because they know that if UN or Brazil or India or China or, or, or uh, the US uh, regulates them, it's probably not gonna be as friendly to the business. The other one is inspiring, attracting and retaining top talent. It's not possible right now, I think, to have a generative competition for top talent if you are not trying to tap into some bigger, uh, uh, some, uh, uh, bigger purpose 
um, uh, roles. Uh, we're seeing this across all companies, across all sectors. The other one is enhancing brand value with key stakeholders. So think of this on, um, on, on, on partnership sides of things. So uh, a lot of small businesses, uh, these can be hotels, uh, these can be um, smaller distributors, uh, these can be middle uh, organizations, um, these can be key suppliers or distributors. They have a choice who they do business and who they partner with and increasingly, especially if they're a if they're setting their own ESG targets, ESG here standing for environmental, social, and governance factors, they're gonna look for partners that do the same. Uh, and the last one is building sustainable supply chains. This one, especially given the, um, the, the, the health, the economic, the social, and the climate related disruptions that happen into global supply chains this year, this is a massive investment area. Um, Unilever, uh, Pepsi, uh, Nestle are making huge investments to create more sustainable supply chains. In many cases, we're seeing them just try and make a, you know, I would, I would argue, and 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 personal opinion here, um, pretty negative supply chain around palm oil. Uh, they're trying to just make that a little less bad. In other areas, they're really looking on creating more generative supply chains all the way through. Um, so the the way I kind of think about and and want to bring fact. Uh, focus back to that $12 trillion number is every year without adequate measurement and monitoring, we're spending $12 trillion in business to business exchanges in ways that are depleting the environment and propagating the inequalities. And there's a real opportunity to turn that into something a lot more beneficial. Um, I'll use coffee here just to make this a little bit more tangible. So for those of you in our kickoff, uh, as we are waiting for a critical mass to join and we're raising up our, our coffee cups, Abigail. Um, it's useful to look at coffee as a, uh, uh, as, a, as a commodity, but also as an, or, uh, uh, I'm sorry, as a product to really emphasize how involved different businesses are along the supply chain. So if you buy a cup of coffee uh, at, a, uh, at a coffee shop, about 90% of that money that you spend will, will end up trickling through your supply chain, right? Um, it's going to go to the businesses that serve that coffee shop. This can be the coffee repair businesses, um, uh, the, the coffee machine repair businesses. Um, this can be the, the distributors. Yes, international shipping containers, but also those maybe getting the beans to ports in the first place. Uh, manufacturing or in coffee's case, roasting. Um, some of you would argue that, wait, shouldn't roasting come after distribution? Sometimes, yes, absolutely, um, right? But these are, again, are, are typically smaller organizations, although certainly not exclusively. Uh, processing, right, uh, especially in coffee, we're often seeing uh, uh, cooperatives here, um, and then sourcing, right? These can be, be family businesses, large and small. Of course, they can also be big corporates. Now, so along all of these steps, we tend to see these small and growing enterprises, and many of them exist for and to benefit their communities. Uh, and what we always are thinking about here at Moving Worlds is how can we help get more of that coffee spend into those hands? And bigger companies, take a Starbucks, are also thinking about the same. And this is where social enterprises are really, we think have a lot of uh, ability to help green up these supply chains. So uh, we set out in, in 20, actually end of 2020, to answer a question to say, is this just, again, a couple companies making lip service or is this a bigger investment? Um, and the report that we ended up publishing is, is called Can Capitalism Lead a More Sustainable and Equitable Recovery? A topic ripe for debate uh, and, and happy to go there. Um, but just a quick overview of, of maybe some of our findings. Um, and actually, before I jump into our findings, really quickly, what I can share here is that we interviewed um, uh, you know, uh, uh, fund leaders at Acumen, uh, corporate social responsibility leaders at um, not only big companies, say Microsoft, SAP, Salesforce, um, but also a, a smaller thousand person, but still global companies, um, as well as social enterprises and a lot of corporate social responsibility leaders. So this is geared a little bit more, if you read, it's geared a little bit more towards the enterprise, the, the, the corporate enterprise, um, but our insights certainly stretch beyond that. So our findings from this, let's start with companies. Very consistently, companies are missing the biggest business uh, opportunity of our time. That's actually a direct quote from Paul Pullman, former CEO of Unilever. Uh, 
very involved in, in UN initiatives related to the Global Compact and the Sustainable Business Forum. And not only that, they're exposing themselves to risk, uh, to competitive risk, to employee attrition risk, to supply chain risk. Uh, and we consistently heard this, especially in more senior ranks of, of companies. Um, we got to speak to a couple of board members of, of publicly traded and venture backed companies. And we consistently saw people um, conflating social enterprises with philanthropy, right? Uh, and what I mean there is to kind of talk about, hey, how can we make our supply chains more, more green and sustainable in a way that will also help realize business benefits um, and, and you know, one of the, the board members said, oh, yeah, no, we, we're kind of a big supporter of that. We give money away, uh, um, you know, to this organization or that organization. And we heard this time and time again, where there's still this, especially senior level leaders at companies tend to go, oh, social enterprise, therefore philanthropy, and they're not thinking about it strategically. Um, there are some really positive um, uh, movements here. Uh, there's a great organization called Competent Boards, which is trying to train board members on ESG factors, um, but definitely a lot more opportunity. We think a lot of potential for disruption, a lot of new business models will develop to actually help educate and bring that audience through. Um, the next group is CSR leaders. So these are people within companies helping trying to make their company both responsible through their own programs, but also on things like reporting. A lot of CSR leaders were saying, now is our time to, to shine, let's take the crisis. And I, I actually still don't like using these words, but I think it does resonate. Never let a good crisis go to waste. Um, they're using this as the opportunity to say, let's integrate CSR into the core enterprise. So instead of a volunteer program or a giving program or a, some type of you know, um, uh, education initiative, let's actually go to sustainability and say, what can we do to make sustain, or I'm sorry, supply chain, what can we do to make our supply chains more green? Let's go to HR. How can we help infuse ideas of, of purpose and equity into all of our onboarding, recruitment, hiring practices? Let's go to marketing and say, as we spend marketing dollars, how do we know that our ads aren't inadvertently ending up on like propaganda websites? Going to distribution saying, what can we do to help reduce carbon in our, in our, um, in our distribution? Um, now that said, it's also immensely challenging. These are underfunded people within companies and they're often chasing too many initiatives. Sometimes the result of CEO saying, oh, hey, let's give money to that thing or put me on stage at this conference. Um, but they are using it. Uh, and I think for social enterprises, corporate social responsibility leaders main, um, are not a good place to go for money. It's typically not there, but they are a good place to go for introductions and connections across the enterprise. Um, to talk to a social enterprise is to talk to an organization that is trying to raise money, um, either in exchange for equity, some type of uh, a loan agreement, or preferably for free. Um, but what we see is that they really miss opportunities to scale on revenues. And um, uh, you know, one example of this, and I won't name the organization, but went to a group that was very progressive on travel tried to get a grant from, um, uh, from the social responsibility team, didn't make it. The corporate social responsibility team offered them to say, hey, we didn't give you this grant, but what I can do is I can connect you to HR. I can connect you to our leadership development team. I can connect you actually to our travel team that manages our own travel policies. And the social enterprise just ghosted, ignored, didn't respond to even a couple of follow-ups, literally walking away from a business deal. Um, even with us behind the scenes saying like, hey, you should really talk to this organization. They have money for you if you're willing to earn it via business. Um, and that's a little bit of an extreme, but we see it time and time again. And, and we see that there are some absolute pain points in partnering with corporations. I'll be the first to admit that that's true. But what also tends to happen is corporations are, if you find the right buyer, are also supportive of scale up and they help they will help invest in capacity building, operational uh, capacity building as well, um, can, and can actually make really strategic partners. Uh, the next one is accelerators. So this kind of speaks a little bit more to, to us, to this crowd. Um, uh, so I, since this report has been published, I've had more interesting conversations that I almost wish I could go back into the report and see. I would say of 
a few of the big, biggest accelerators where and impact investors. If I were to list them by name right now, you would probably say, oh, yep, yep, we know them. Yep, we know them. Um, uh, roughly a quarter to one third of their enterprises that they've invested in are actually asking for business connections and the accelerators aren't poised in order to, to, um, uh, uh, to create those connections. Um, and what we're seeing is coming out of accelerators, about one in 10 enterprises will actually qualify for next level funding. It's important to connect these high scale potential organizations to funding for sure, if it's available. However, the amount of effort, if you spread that across 10 companies to say, hey, let's get every company funding ready, but only one of you statistically is going to get the funding, we're over investing on things like pitch presentations and impact investing presentations when the vast majority of organizations won't get that funding. Um, and so this is why we say overly focused on that next level funding. And in fact, uh, a few of the, the accelerators that we interviewed actually did say, yes, our social enterprises are asking us for that for these connections. Um, we don't have them. We're trying to get them to raise funding first and then build the operational capacity to partner with corporations. It's not it's not wrong. What I would say is what should be done alongside of that is also validating if the company needs to build that operational capacity first, or can they actually develop the right partnerships to build capacity while actually partnering uh, on a revenue-based um, uh, uh, sales agreement. Um, and um, I, will, I won't really touch on policymakers. This is kind of a bigger loaded topic, um, but we actually, we do think that we're gonna see um, quite a bit more um, uh, policy support uh, the UK especially is doing a lot here, um, albeit with a slightly different uh, approach and definition of what social enterprises are. Uh, however, uh, we do think that we will see more um, uh, policy level improvements um, to, uh, uh, to fund and support social enterprises. And if you are looking for examples of that, um, you can Google like Utrecht, Netherlands, like social enterprise community, uh, and you'll see kind of a big investment um, that uh, that specific city uh, has done in order to create more of a social enterprise hub. And what's interesting is the policymakers are very much bringing corporates in as, as part of that. Overall, um, we do think that the social enterprise sector will grow. Uh, it's gonna grow. There's more and more impact investing uh, capital that, that's being released. Um, I, I don't remember if it published this week or last week or within the last couple of weeks, um, but the IFC just published a new report sizing up the impact investing industry. Um, it's now over $2 trillion um, in total, but they add a caveat that says uh, it's only 500 million that's actively being measured for impact. Some of it's a little bit more theoretical, right? That's a big jump uh, over, over years past. We're seeing companies doing more and more around ESG investments. Um, and so we do see more money coming to social enterprises. Um, that said, there is a need, we would say across all entities to be a little bit more strategic on how companies, um, I'm sorry, of how social enterprises can realize this money coming from the, um, from the corporate sector. Um, I will say one of my favorite quotes uh, that, we, that we got from our research um, is uh, um, this one, uh, that companies are making bigger commitments on sustainability but they don't know how to achieve it, they will need to partner with social enterprises. Only then can corporations reach their increasingly audacious sustainability and equity, equity commitments. It was good to hear this from somebody within a very, very large international company highlight that we are not able to actually achieve our ESG targets through our existing philanthropic models. We have to figure out how to partner with social enterprises. Um, so, um, so what I thought we could kind of do here, oh, cool, I see a chat box. Um, okay, uh, sorry to lose you, it's great to see you. Um, so what I'd love to do here is um, we're actually gonna jump into, into Mural. I don't know how many of you are kind of active engagement versus just kind of watching in. So what I will do is I will continue to share my screen. So if you don't feel like engaging, that is totally fine. Um, 
uh, I will share my screen. And if you want, you can actually chat things to me and I can always add it to you. But what we're going to do is play in Mural and maybe quick show of hands. Um, who here has used Mural before? All right, got a couple. If you haven't, no worries. If you're on a mobile, honestly, Mural is not great. So you'll, you'll just stay watching my screen, cool, a couple of yet. So um, let me give you a quick mural tour, if nothing else from this session. Um, hopefully you'll, you'll learn a cool new tool that's good for virtual collaboration. Um, think of this as just like a giant whiteboard uh, with, with endless sticky notes um, that, that we can use uh, for our meeting. So um, in just a moment, I will invite you here, but I think it's worth I take two minutes to just give you a quick tour of the platform and how it works. Um, uh, Michael, no worry that you're on mobile. Um, I'll keep sharing my screen. And if you want, you can actually chat your, your responses to me and I'll, I'll play your scribe uh, and we'll get these on the mural board. So we can we still get your inputs if you, if you wanna join them um, or if you wanna contribute them. So this is a giant mural board. Um, using your cursor, you can either like zoom in or zoom out. Um, you can also in this bottom right corner, um, uh, in the bottom right corner, you can see that there's kind of this map, um, and you can grab the zoom bar. You can use this. Uh, you can drift around. Um, this is one thing that trips people up sometimes. There's this little hand. It's called move mode. So if you ever find your place where the only thing you can do is like move the mural around, hopefully I'm not making anybody seasick, um, just uh, you can uncheck that move mode, uh, and you can, um, you can still move without it. Um, so your mouse can be a good zoom in, zoom out partner, but you can also you can also use this. Now, the real magic of, of Mural comes through our ability to add a bunch of sticky notes. Um, the way you add sticky notes is really quite simple. You double click. Uh, and then once you double click, a sticky note is added. Um, if you don't like the sticky note over here on the left side, you can always uh, click over here. And you can see that there's different colors of sticky notes. Um, or if you're really fancy, you can also just change the color here yourself to anything you like. So um, in just a moment, I'm going to actually have some uh, prompts that I'll show up. Um, but I thought just as a first uh, crash course, maybe what we could do is um, you could come onto this map, um, add a sticky note kind of closest to, to where you live. Um, and then you can just kind of put your, put your name and write Seattle and then maybe your organization. And you're like, man, Mark, that is really small. Mural's got us covered. If you, um, you can always just uh, zoom in on it at, at a later time. Um, and then, of course, one of the great features of Mural is this uh, little magnifying thing. So if you hit down X uh, and hover over a card, it makes it a little bigger. So if you're on mobile, Michael, sorry, it'll be a little small for you, um, but still hopefully legible. So uh, with that said, I'm going to go ahead and create a visitor link here, copied. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and drop it in the chat box here, um, and you will all be able to join. Uh, this is potentially one of my favorite parts. Uh, is typically you will join as an animal, uh, an anonymous animal at that. Um, so we've got an anonymous, uh, a goat, visiting goat is good. Uh, we've got a cat, uh, a raccoon, got my eyes on you. Oh, a koala. That's lovely. I love koalas. Uh, a crab and a horse. So um, so yeah, get, get acquainted here for a second. And then um, don't worry if you click over somebody else's card, but let's go ahead and uh, just double click, uh, add your name, uh, your city, uh, in your country, or I'm sorry, in your organization. All right, wonderful. Wonderful muraling, everybody. Cool, so um, if anybody finds themselves ever uh, like confused or overwhelmed by the number of like names and, and pointers uh, going around, um, if you actually go down to the bottom, um, you can, uh, and hover kind of over your name, uh, then there's an option that says broadcast my cursor and don't show me cursors. So you click on don't show me cursors, everybody's cursors kind of go away. So that can make things a little less frenetic 
um, or if you kind of like the energy and the chaos of everybody moving their their cursors around. Um, so what what I um, let's actually kind of kind of zoom in here. Um, uh, it it actually is possible that I was I was too aggressive with our um, uh, with our sizing here, and things are things are a little too small. But but let's see. Oh, and then of course my zoom feature isn't working. Um, cool. So um, we've got social roots, integrated capital investing, uh, conveners.org. What's that group do? Uh, we've got the African Women Entrepreneurship Collective, um, uh, the Global Accelerator Network. Uh, uh, Lizzie, you know, when you joined earlier, I was like, I was scratching my head. I'm like, I know this thing. Where is it? And then, of course, now it now it rings. I love the research that I know. That, I know, Mark. We were connecting last um, last April, and I, that's I, right. um, I it's just really good to see you again. Yep, you too, um, uh, Michael. I have got you covered. Um, I'm gonna get you. I'm gonna get you added there on the card. Um, yeah, I big fan of Gan Gan research. If if any of you haven't seen that, um, cool conveners. Um, hey, all right, cool. Terrix Innovation Lab, awesome. Okay, so um, that was just a fun mural crash course. You all passed uh, with with flying colors. Um, Sarah, I don't know if there's a competition for best best visual of the conveners event, but I'd like to nominate this. Um, you don't have to. You don't have to say anything now that might, might demotivate me. Um, so, okay, cool. So now that we've got that going, um, what we're going to do here is uh, I'm going to go ahead and direct our attention to um, this section. And I'm just curious, kind of from the collective knowledge here, is does anybody have a example of an effective corporate and social enterprise partnership? So not with an accelerator, but with a social enterprise. Now, in this case, I've already added stickies. So this time, you don't need to double click and add your own, although if you want to, that's fine. Um, rather, what you can do is just go ahead and, and type. And you know, one thing I'm actually going to do here is I'm just going to size this up. Um, so if you'll humor me for a moment, um, these things were just a little kind of too small. Um, so to help make them a little bit bigger as we go here, I'm going to lock this back up. Um, cool. So, uh, so yeah, I'd love to see some examples. And if you could mention both the corporate name and the social enterprise name, um, then I'd love to just kind of hear and and um, and then in just a moment, if it's okay, I'll I'll call it on a couple of you, maybe just to to share, just so we can help make uh, today's session a little more real. Um, for for uh, Michael, anybody else on mobile, feel free to, you can also unmute yourself and I'll scribe, um, or you can throw it in chat box and I can carry it over um, if that's not working well. This, this is interesting. This is actually the first time I've kind of prompted this this exact uh, question. Um, it is kind of funny, right, to see the um, we definitely uh, we do, it's definitely easiest to kind of think of the big companies, and then we're like, wait, but who is the who is who is the company? Who is who is that little social enterprise, right? Um, and honestly, I think that really relates to what we see in the research, where these bigger companies um, are saying. I'm trying to partner with social enterprises, right? I'm trying to find all fair trade. I'm trying to, to source from co-ops. I'm trying to do this. And they oftentimes um, uh, don't find organizations that have enough capacity in order to deliver on their needs. I'll give you one very real example. Uh, Timberland was looking for um, uh, two different projects. Uh, one was involving organic cotton um, and they were trying to find uh, either a cooperative or smallholder far farmer um, alliance community or social enterprises that could help source their organic cotton needs. And they couldn't find it. Uh, and 
they ended up creating a partnership with the Smallholder Farmers Alliance and one other initiative, which of course I'm blanking on right now. Um, and in that partnership, they were then able to actually help um, uh, achieve their, their sourcing goals and requirements. Um, the reason I think this is such a good, um, uh, maybe recognition, right, of the power of accelerators, right, is we see these big companies and we see them all saying, but I don't have it, like, I don't remember the social enterprise name, right? And that's because the social enterprises are just a lot, um, are just a lot smaller. But this is where accelerators, I think, have a lot of potential to add value, right? To go to these companies and say, we have either one or multiple social enterprises within a sector, we can help make connections and we're gonna help de-risk this social enterprise, right? In the same way that many investors or accelerators de-risk their own contributions in social enterprises with philanthropic capital, accelerators can help de-risk uh, um, social enterprise partnerships with the corporate sector by providing extra capacity building support and others. Um, I'll give a shout out to our anonymous Al, who highlighted both the corporate name Pete's and a social enterprise name, uh, Heavenly Organics, um, for organic wild honey um, from indigenous communities uh, uh, in India. Um, uh, who, uh, whoever is our, our anonymous Al, uh, oh, I'm sorry, was that the, might have been the, the raccoon? Who's our visiting raccoon? Who wrote that one? Does anybody remember? Okay, we'll, we'll go without it. So, um, it's me. I'm I'm oh, the raccoon. Hey it's All right. Jen. Um, <laughs> I I love it. Could you share just maybe a little bit more about the Pete's Coffee and and Heavenly Organics to the extent that you know about it? I I might be putting you on the spot, so feel free to say pass. Yeah, I was part of a of a group that invested in Heavenly Organics. I'm no longer part of them. Um, I don't know how much you want to know about it, but it's a um, it's a company out yeah. of Iowa that imports um, wild um, regenerative, you know, locally sourced honey um, from indigenous communities. And um, they entered into an agreement with Pete's to supply the little packets of honey um, into their, into their uh, you know, for individual use. Very cool. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for sharing that, right? I think, um, the uh, the story seems somewhat almost consistent with other ones that we've heard, right? Of sometimes you're seeing these like middle-based organizations that are able to solve the current corporate need, but sometimes partner across a few different uh, a few different social enterprises. So, so great example there. Um, and really, yeah, across the across the board here, I, I think there's a great example. Uh, uh, I'm up in Seattle uh, where we had a Levi's. Um, and uh, gosh, and now I'm blanking on the name. I want to say it's called New Cycle, but that might actually not not be accurate. Um, uh, which was uh, an organization that figured out how to cost effectively recycle um, denim uh, and and distribute that back to to Levi's um, for for new jeans. So some really cool organizations here. Um, so now what I'd like to to kind of do um, is we're going to go to the next section here, um, and in this section I'd love to hear about. What are some examples of corporate and accelerator partnerships that you're aware of? Um, and so specifically here, what I'm looking for, and there's actually one that I saw, um, actually, hold on, sorry, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna do the same thing that I did before. I'm just gonna make this, I'm gonna make this bigger for a second so that everything will be just a little bit, a little bit easier to, uh, to read here. Um, so there was actually, Sorry, does oh. that include corporates that are running their own accelerators or separate accelerator programs, separate corporate? Cool, great question. I'll take both. Yep, okay. I'll take both. So, <laughs> you know, an accelerator that's partnered with a company um, or maybe you've seen some other where the accelerator has almost helped, uh, uh, you know, create a portfolio or, or create some type of partnership um, uh, to, to help get more social enterprises um, involved in the corporate sector. Um, so yeah, with that said, uh, everybody kind of join me down. Uh, let's see, I'll summon you all. Um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and now you're all released. I'd love to see what some of those partnerships are.
this mural thing is cool. Yeah, mural 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 can uh, can really help out in uh, in some situations. Yeah, yeah, I, I can see the usefulness of it. I, I like it. If nothing else, I've given you this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, some great stuff kind of getting getting added here. Cool. Um, so one thing I'll I'll add here is um, for anybody that hasn't, there's a WEF COVID Response Alliance uh, for social enterprises. Um, and on this card, I'm going to go ahead and link um, the the actual. Um, website that has the report. I'll put it in the chat box as well, um, in case that's that's easier. Um, they uh, they also highlight some uh, partnerships, both at the accelerator and the individual social enterprise uh, level, in case anybody wants to to nerd out more on that. Um, let's see. So, um, cool. Maybe uh, does anybody want to? Um, maybe they've shared one that that they'd like to elaborate on. Um, and uh, and maybe share just a little bit a little bit more. Maybe you didn't have the chance to to add it to the the mural board here, but you'd be open to um, to share something. No. Anybody? I guess I I have a a hunch that bumping people into possible corporate partners might be more common in um, software accelerators or actually like tech accelerators. And I wonder if having topic based, so you have like health businesses in an accelerator or climate businesses in an accelerator, um, instead of just lumping all of the social enterprises together might might attract different, that, that just occurred to me. Yep, uh, Christina, um, it's, it's, it's a great point. I think you're right on. I think we've seen this in a couple of different ways, um, right? We've started to see some accelerators. Let's look at Village Capital as an example for anybody that's familiar or has followed them for what, over a decade now that they've been in operation. Um, you know, they started as just an accelerator, right? And then they started to create these cohorts where they did like the Ag Tech Accelerator or the FinTech Accelerator. Um, uh, uh, Looney, uh, 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 who runs uh, the Fledge Accelerator and the Fledge Accelerator Network saw so many ag tech biz, uh, ag and ag tech businesses coming through that actually kind of created a network called Africa Eats um, specifically to better distribute both capital funding into that network, but also in places to help pool different supplies from that network into bigger buyers and more consistent buyers. Um, and, um, and so, uh, Christina, I think you're spot on, and I think it's one of the ways where we see accelerators um, having more potential to partner with corporations is to say, hey, if I'm going to a tech company, right, let's do something more around, let's take Microsoft as an example, accessibility, right? We know that's a strategic priority for them. Can we find tech businesses in our network um, like uh, Voice It, which is a social enterprise working on speech accessibility uh, for people that have um, any uh, that are experiencing uh, or do have any speech impediments, um, being able to to create a, a software layer so um, all individuals can can communicate with AI machines uh, and IoT devices and others, uh, right? So companies like a Microsoft who might care a lot about accessibility, um, right? Can you as an accelerator help kind of create more awareness and education about that as well as connections to the types of social enterprises that are fluent on that? Um, it's, a, it's a really, really great point. Um, and some cool examples here that, that I haven't heard of, um, like uh, this, the PDX um, Puppet Innovation Labs is new to me. Um, so is the Dairy Farmers of America and T-Mobile. Um, I'm, I'm admittedly very intrigued and we'll definitely be Googling these later. Um, cool. So, 
the next thing I'd, I'd like to, to just kind of harvest here as, as we, we come towards the, the end of our session um, is to, to ask like, what makes these partnerships effective? Um, and so if you'll join me here at, at the bottom of the mural, um, I'm actually gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna make this just a little bit bigger for us so it's a little easier to read. Um, I gotta make my, my mural board just a little, little bigger as well. Um, and I'd love to see if, um, if as a group, we do have any, uh, any ideas here um, that uh, can, can help us think about of like, if we are interested in partnering with the corporate sector, it's, it's not without risk. Um, you know, sometimes corporations can actually make things a little bit more challenging for us. Um, and so what ideas might we have um, and inputs do we have to make these partnerships uh, effective? a great list all. You know, if we if, if we had more time the, the next prompt would, would probably be uh, um, what makes these what makes these partnerships fail uh, we, we could potentially have some fun around the, the negative uh, implications here uh, uh, but uh, but alas we didn't get there but if if that sparks any ideas as well, feel free to kind of give us positive spin um, as to ways that things that we could do to make sure these partnerships really do work. Um, and then what I'm going to do is is maybe just start reading through some of these. Um, and if if anybody does want to uh, elaborate um, or or uh, ask for clarification or even ask for advice on any of this, um, I'll read through these for a couple minutes, and then we'll we'll have about five minutes of of Q and A here. Um, so, um, there is, let's see, as I'm just kind of reading these, I, I love that trust is there first, um, uh, data, um, I am curious whoever wrote data, if data could mean a, a few different things, right? Is this impact data on the back end? Is it data from the enterprises? I don't know if whoever wrote that feels like elaborating there, um, but we definitely see data as a currency. Um, would anybody feel like, uh, uh, Elaborating on that that contribution. It's in the chat. Impact. Cool. Okay. Yep. Impact data, right? Like, hey, if we're kind of making these investments, we want to understand how how this is working. And um, the the aligned vision, I think that's really really important. Um, one thing I'll I'll highlight here is, um, oftentimes you know corporate priorities will shift as time goes on. Um, and so um, what I would say is you might not always find that, that perfect vision alignment, but what I would actually look for is, is some level of long-term programmatic alignment. Um, in our research, one thing that, that we were told uh, by, uh, by an interview with a you know, uh, large international uh, coffee company uh, that um, you know, there is a risk that the company is aware of when they decide to partner with social enterprises. They are going to say, hey, you have to upskill and grow a lot of demand in order to meet our demands. If we ever shift priority in the future, or if you're not then capable of delivering on this commitment, we won't be able to continue, which means you have to go find another potential buyer. And there's only so many big international coffee companies that are focused on sustainability. So there is this kind of sometimes risk of social enterprises connecting into, into companies. Um, and so it is really important to have that alignment, especially if you as an accelerator are helping bridge and, and make any of these connections. Um, I love learning mindset. Uh, that was one thing that 
there was a few of us uh, killing some time uh, at the beginning of this call and we decided that it's something we all share in common. So I'm happy to see that there. Um, uh, clear expectations. Um, and I love this, startups being corporate ready. Um, we're in conversation with, um, with the, with the uh, impact investing organization right now, um, trying to help answer that question of what does it mean to be corporate ready? Um, this means a lot of things, right? This from a legal side, it means that the, the social enterprises understand um, that there are usually multiple layers of legal approval. Uh, in the S-Grid program, we help educate uh, our social enterprises that if you're partnering with a bigger company, you're probably gonna first create something like a master services agreement. You might have to get some type of DUNS number or other credit organization. From there, you'll probably create a statement of work and then you actually have to get on a pretty tight accounting. Um, you might also have to start working across some enterprise systems like SAP's Ariba. Um, and so there is this real uh, work to get corporate ready beyond getting the product corporate ready because of course that's an important part of this too. Can you operationally get your product up to a place to meet the consistent demand from a corporation? It's not easy. It's also why we see companies um, having capacity already in place to help do that, because that's not a problem that they only encounter with social enterprises. It's also a problem that they encounter with any business that they work with. So it's, it's important to know that yes, that's a risk, but corporations, are great partners in helping us bridge that. So the solution to achieving scale sometimes is just being honest and open about what you do have, what you are capable of and seeking partnership. Um, I think some of these other ones are, are, are great. Um, uh, <laughs> I, love, I love the timeframe one. I think that's a fantastic alignment. Um, one thing I'll share um, uh, actually in the chat box here is there's seven frameworks that we consistently see being used um, in conversations involving these partnerships with the corporate sector. Um, many of these frameworks are around trust building, uh, uh, shared value alignment, partnership building, and et cetera. So if you do find yourself wondering, how can we help get social enterprises ready? Oftentimes these frameworks um, tend to, I think, map really, really well to this. Um, cool, so we've got a question here. I'm gonna jump into Q&A. Um, we've got a couple minutes. Um, uh, Sarah, I forget if we have a hard stop in two minutes or, or if we can kind of stretch over um, a, a little bit or not. So I might, I might ask for your guidance there. Um, but... you, can, you can stretch over a couple of minutes, but the next session will start. I have to hop to help them with it. But um, if people want to stay in this session and then go to the next, that's totally fine with me. Cool. Well, I know I've at least got time for this question. So the question is, um, could you share your opinion on how a social enterprise balances corporate income opportunities with potential values misalignment since the majority of corps ultimately see this as a branding strategy or ESG play to check off a box? It's such a great question. It's the biggest critique that we've had in rolling out this research. Um, what I would say is there are some companies that are, are truly uh, working on becoming carbon neutral, water neutral, uh, um, uh, uh, em employee uh, equitable um, and just. The way that you can tell that that's true is if their board has a committee um, and an evaluation and compensation criteria on that. Currently this represents less than 10% of public boards, but it's still thousands of companies. Um, there's an executive leadership position on that. Executive compensation is tied to ESG factors. And you also see senior level leadership in, in ESG function. Um, it's not a guarantee then that that company is going to be a good partner and move beyond just branding, um, but it's a really, really good indicator. So I think part of this question is that. The second thing that, that we guide on is to say, are you kind of fulfilling a need and will get kind of washed out of this organization? Or are you able to help kind of, you know, uh, you know, David beat Goliath, right? Are you able to actually help move this entire company to be more responsible? Um, one of our social enterprises described it as a little bit of a, as a Trojan horse, right? The amount of specifically uh, in this case, the social enterprise saying, the amount of carbon offset that I'm capable of doing is definitely very limited. If I can get this, you know, um, uh, a global uh, uh, food and beverage company 
to move the needle on these things, I could actually 100x my impact just through this one partnership. So I do think it's something that social enterprises need to look at and say, am I just helping on this one little product thing and I'm just helping make them more money? Or am I actually, do I have potential to get more involved with this company in a way that actually helps kind of green and make more equitable um, and just the entire company? It's not easy. It's very case by case. I don't have a set definition for it. Um, I love the chat box contribution right now. It's hard for a social enterprise who's reliant on revenue to kind of stand up and say, hey, company, you can do this, but you also have to do these other things. It's a great place where accelerators can come in, right? It's accelerators that can come in and say, hey, look, we can help make these partnerships, but you've got to commit to bigger impact. And you can actually push on these on these bigger entities more so than say a social enterprise that's connecting into the to the supply chain. Um, I think there's a great comment here also uh, for both Christina and Lizzie in the chat box. Um, uh, or sorry, question first from from Christina. Um, and I do want to say we are at time. If you want to jump, I'm still recording, so we'll kind of get this shared out. Um, otherwise, I'll I'll take these two questions and then I'll wrap this up here. Um, so oh, Christine, just an example. It wasn't a question. Oh. It was just oh, okay. an example of how the accelerators could ask the companies, oh, the corporations. Perfect. Yeah. Nailed it. Awesome. Um, and then Lizzie uh, also um, made an addition here. Startup and Excel can focus on what they are going to do to help, how they're going to help the corporation save money, attract new customers, and become more efficient in their operations. 100%. This goes back to the five different ways that social impact organizations add value to, to um, uh, or I'm sorry, how five different ways that social impact initiatives add value to companies um, and accelerators can help advocate for that so to, to create deeper integrations. So everybody, I want to thank you all for joining, uh, getting, um, getting your, 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 your fingers and, and clickers um, in Mural here, uh, sharing input. Really appreciate uh, you all. Um, we'll share the Mural, the slide, and the recording uh, afterwards. Um, if anybody does want to get in touch uh, with me ever down the line, uh, my email is just uh, movingworlds dot or mark at movingworlds.org. Uh, thanks so much for, for being here. Uh, enjoy your next sessions and, and enjoy the rest. Um, and thanks to uh, the great folk at Conveners for, uh, for having me. Awesome. Thanks, everybody.